How's it going everybody? So in this video, I'm going to be outlining uh, the scientific approach to strain and conditioning for athletic performance. And specifically, we're going to be talking about combat athletes, MMA, Jiu Jitsu, etc. Because that is, that's been my primary focus for the last four years or so. So, out of, so this is a scientific approach. This is a general consensus of what the evidence suggests is the best approach. And if you look at most of the highest caliber athletes that are not genetic phenoms or, you know, the, the highest caliber athletes and, and coaches, performance coaches, who took people from baseline and made them into beasts, this is what works the best. You will see this in common, uh, commonalities. You'll see this with strength coaches like Phil DeRue, who used to work for American Top Team, and he trains people like Dustin Poirier and Joanna... I can't even say her name right, sorry. Um, and he worked with Junior Del Santos. Um, and then, of course, um, what else? Uh, Grodd Strength, uh, who trained many uh, Olympic caliber uh, Olympic wrestlers. And um, uh, Chad Wesley Smith, who works with, he's worked with dozens of uh, professional jujitsu athletes including uh, Buchecha and uh, Raul Bo Bojau, I can't say a lot of these like Brazilian names, um, who, who win gold at, at, at Worlds uh, at Black Belt. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. And basically, you can take an athlete who's already good, who's got the baseline level of technique and leverage and skill, and you can make them even more impactful through proper strength and conditioning. So this works both in the field and, the, and has been highlighted by the greatest strength and conditioning coaches uh, with the highest level athletes and also um, through the scientific evidence, okay? So no gimmicks here, okay? So here's what we're doing. We are taking the 20% of methods and efforts that will yield us 80% of results. The fact is, combat athletes, they a lot of times do not have the, a, a lot of time in the gym, and they don't have a lot of recovery capacity. Everything that they do at, with a strength and conditioning coach, you need to take into consideration what they're doing with their skills coach, okay? And you need to make sure that the skills training is number one. So let's just get into the principles. This is a two-factor model of sports performance, okay? And we're going to kind of add in some extra things to it to make it better because it's not good enough on its own. The two-factor model is basically uh, what you do at your sport practice should give you the majority of your cardiovascular adaptations. The said principle, specific adaptation to impose demands, is key. Okay, the, the the conditioning needed to go, you know, five five minute rounds like a title MMA fight. Uh, that is best going to be got, uh, obtained through sparring rounds. Okay, and in the foundational level, you need to be doing a lot of uh, a lot of flow rolling and a lot of technical sparring that includes punches to the face at a controlled intensity. Uh, there is no reason for athletes to be going 100% all of the time, especially in their off season. Uh, there are a lot of great uh, schools that have, that, do, that have produced world champions that way. American Kickboxing Academy, uh, Shootbox, etc., etc. And those are a lot of like old school gyms that have been around for a long time, but the problem is they have a pretty large peak with their genetic phenoms. It weeds out a lot of the people that just don't have the genetics to go through suboptimal training, and it can peak them for competition really fast. But there's a lot of wear and tear, and a lot of times these people have a short-lived career where it's like, man, they were way up top, and they could have been way, way better for a lot longer, but they get injured. Catastrophic injuries from just their high intensity of training too, with too much volume and too much frequency over time. And that's where the, the science of strength and conditioning comes in the picture where you can take that and organize it in a way that allows you to still get that high, high intensity um, uh, pra skills practice, 
but moderate moderated enough and put it at the right times with the right volume and right frequency especially the closer you get to camp the more specific training needs to be the harder it needs to be the more practice focus it needs to be um basically the last four weeks of your training of your training before camp it or before uh competition it needs to look very close to what you're actually going to be doing in competition. But the majority of your training year round, it needs to be a high volume and high frequency of, of um, the, the most effective basics over and over again. Okay. So again, so that means uh, te technical sparring. Okay. Uh, for me personally, I have seen time and time again, especially with beginners who don't already have good enough technique you know those people, the beginners, people who aren't really good at striking yet. They're gonna be, they're either gonna freeze up or they're gonna brawl aimlessly to close the distance um, when they're doing hard sparring because they're afraid, afraid of getting hit because they don't have confidence in their technique yet. And you build confidence in your technique by practicing at a lower intensity in a controlled environment over and over again until you can uh, practice that when you have punches coming in the face. That confidence is there. You know what to do in those situations where you don't get pelted and CTE or whatever concussions. Um, but anyway, no matter no matter what, at the higher level, it's even more important. The lower level is still important. You need a high volume of high, and high frequency of sparring. You need the the technical sparring. You need the the flow rolling. Okay, and flow rolling needs to be done properly. You can't because otherwise you're going to have false, uh, unrealistic expectations of what you can get away with. Okay, in in all kind of light sparring situations, there is a high degree of like false sense of security, which is why hard sparring is important. So anyway, this is going to build your aerobic capacity. Okay, this is going to build your basic foundation level of conditioning. That is still fight specific, even though it's not a high intensity. Okay, you're getting the the you know the what you normally get from long runs. You're going to be getting that from your high volume of you know round after round. You know whether it's three minute rounds, five minute rounds. You do that over and over again for at least sixty minutes, and do that pretty frequently, like three to five days a week. Get some form of technical sparring in. You're going to be building a killer cardiovascular system. Work capacity is key here. Work capacity means your ability to do the work necessary over the duration necessary for the period. Okay? So if you can do a steady state run for 60 minutes or even walking, walking for 60 minutes at a time, every single day that's building the work capacity for your body the capacity for your body to sustain a work output energy output for 60 minutes without stop you're training the blood flow and the energy systems that keep outputting consistently for that period of time people who are new to this and their work capacity is shit need to start at the low end okay just walking for 60 minutes a day will in fact have a huge impact you don't need to be redlining it in fact you need to avoid redlining it because that actually ruins your recovery and it blunts the adaptations. You get diminishing returns where your body doesn't adapt and you're sore all the time, you're injured. So work capacity is highly dependent on your ability to sustain low intensity efforts for a long period of time over and over again for uh, you know day in and day out. Uh, and you don't have to run to do this. You could do heavy bag. You could just do flow sparring. Flow sparring and drilling builds your aerobic capacity. Drilling arm bars over and over again for 60 minutes is going to build a, a work capacity and it's going to build more efficient technique. Drilling is important. Drilling is key. Uh, flow rolling is key. Okay. Light sparring is key. Skills practice is number one. And you need to have an intention when you go in there. Intentional practice, okay? Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, okay? So you have to be training in an environment where it's as specific as possible to your competition, but it's at an intensity at which you can focus in on executing techniques with good form. Because if you're going balls to wall all the time, 
trying to execute arm bars and stuff with like piss poor form because you haven't practiced enough at a low intensity, then what's going to happen? Like when you're in competition, that sloppiness, you're going to get knocked out. You're going to get tapped out. People are going to pass your guard. So anyway, that's important, okay? A baseline foundation of technical sparring is how you build Max Holloway, okay? Max Holloway style um, conditioning, okay? Uh, I have a, I actually have a client who trained at Max Holloway's gym through the majority of his childhood because he lived in Hawaii. He was from the, Hawaii. And he told me firsthand that that's what Max Holloway's gym was all about. Lots and lots of technical sparring. Um, and you look at how Max Holloway can sustain that output for a long period of time. Now, mind you, he doesn't have that same kind of knockout ability. And that can be developed through that ball to wall mentality. But it's important to have both. You need to sprinkle in that high intensity um, at the right times, okay? Because there is fatigue that builds up. So I'll explain fatigue later. So this is a foundation, okay? A foundation of low intensity, technique focused training that's as specific as possible to your competition most of the time, okay? And then uh, in the off season, you should still have some hard sparring, but it needs to be. So first of all, like maybe once a week, you have that hard sparring and it needs to still have that specificity competition because you don't want to build bad habits, okay? One way that it can be done is no face shots and just hard to the body, you know, kicks and punches the body super hard and light and then uh, no punches to the face. So no punches to the face is not good because then it, it trains your body to go hard to the body and stuff like that and a, like strength punching. It's going to look like Kyokushin karate basically. And meanwhile, your hands are down, you're focused on blocking your, your stomach, but in an actual kickboxing competition, uh, Muay Thai or MMA, you need to guard your face and you need to develop that like awareness, like, oh shit, I got to focus on my face too. Because if you look, th this is important, like Taekwondo fighters who come in MMA, a lot of times they have that hands down mentality and you know, if they can't sustain their distance and their Taekwondo stuff, they're going to get punched in the face and get knocked out. So anyway, you know, you got to train hard and you got to moderate your amount of concussions and stuff like that and moderate the amount of fatigue, which has a very specific meaning in science so that you're, you can recover for the next training session session. Okay. Your ability to recover from training is vitally important. You cannot be maxing out on, on squats and deadlifts every single day. You cannot be maxing out on sparring or every single day because muscle break. So here's what fatigue means. Muscle breakdown. Okay. There is pro inflammatory cytokines that are released in response to hard training, no matter what kind of training it is that build up. And if are, if they're not, you know, you can get, this is why a lot of fighters, they get sick, their immune system, you know, in, in, in training camp, uh, you know, colds and infections are a lot more frequent and common because they're cutting weight, uh, their body's under a lot of stress and they're training hardest, the hardest out of the year. All those pro-inflammatory cytokines and the, uh, byproducts of their hard training is catching up with them. And now they get sick. This can happen in the off season too, even if you're eating enough food, if you're training too hard. Um, muscle breakdown. Okay, you start to get protein uh, byproducts in the urine, and you need to rebuild that protein as fast as you can um, and adequately as you can to recover for the next training session. Otherwise, you get more muscle breakdown. Even if you're not, even if you're not worried about like size, not about size. Um, this can create performance decrements. And what can happen is you have a net loss of adaptations over time. Uh, you get neurological fatigue, you get peripheral fatigue, okay? And you get um, a whole bunch of buildup uh, products, like what they call toxins, like the real meaning of the word. Um, basically, just inflammatory byproducts as a direct result of the damage that's caused by hard training accumulate over time. So you need to moderate that damage by training intelligently at a moderate pace, auto-regulating training. The biggest responsibility of a coach is to look at his athletes 
seeing how they're performing, and then moderating training to get the most adaptation for that day with the least amount of recovery cost. And in this way, you can be building their techniques day to day, training just at that threshold where it's challenging enough, where they're still solid on their technique, they're getting some conditioning effect, and they're not going to like, you know, come into practice dead the next day. They should be sleeping well. They shouldn't be so overwhelmingly sore that like, you know, for days they have like, you know, weird aches and pains that they can't explain. Okay. Because there's no use in having a champion fighter who, you know, is really, really good, but he's like constantly sidelined by injuries. That champion fighter could be better if he wasn't, you know, dragging during training over and over again. So anyway, um, that's the key. Get those techniques in, okay? Get that sparring in at a high frequency. It's, it's got to be sustainable, Okay. The better you can recover, the more volume of training you can handle. You want to be that athlete who has more hours under your belt of productive training rather than the person who has to keep taking time off because they're injured or they're sick or they have to keep like, you know, underperforming or they're training so hard that they can't focus on technique. You're going to build bad habits. So that's key. Very, very key. That's the first part of strength and conditioning. That is where you get your card, your so-called cardio from. Your fight-specific cardio comes from your sport practice. That is key. So then the second part of this is we need to train our strength. Okay, strength comes second to that. Okay, so strength training is your is building your body's capacity to produce force, to resist force. Okay, and Capacity. That means the ceiling goes up. If you take an athlete who already can jump really high, they can run really fast, and they have really good technique in their sport, they have a baseline level of athleticism that's great. Now, the problem is they will plateau at a certain point to where they cannot develop that anymore. Uh, you could always get better at technique regardless of your force production. However, the speed, the power that that athlete can produce is directly proportional to the amount of force capacity. If you train strength training, we're talking, this is force capacity training here. When you train strength training, when you do barbell back squats, for example, in the one to eight rep range, okay, over 70% of your one rep max, that is directly increasing the ceiling for force production that that athlete can produce, okay? So that ceiling, the higher that ceiling is, the more that the potential is for that athlete to keep increasing their power output, the harder they can punch, the, the more explosive they can be in scrambles, the more explosive they can be in punching blitzes and exchanges of, of, of punching, especially in the clinch, okay? That athlete has a peak. They have a ceiling that, that can only be increased through strength training. And that is where strength training comes in. Strength training is not just like, oh, increasing your you know, ability to throw people around. Like that is one aspect, absolutely, directly. You will see, you can't, I have seen times and again power lifters, okay, who come into wrestling or jiu-jitsu class. Okay, at many different schools, and maybe they have a little bit of wrestling under their belt, and they're able to tussle with the blue belts pretty effectively just because they're so strong already. Um, however, okay, strength is not number one. That's why we spent so much time talking about technique. Technique is number one. Your ability to produce force in the right positions is important. Leverage, make no mistake, leverage is force produced efficiently and effectively or 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 uh, positioned effectively okay it's still force production but it's not reliant on your ceiling okay the better your leverage is the better you can apply that force someone can never train strength and just have great leverage and great technique and be really really great and be a dominant 
But make no mistake, if that person who already understands leverage and already understands technique gets stronger in the one to eight rep range over time, their leverage is going to suck so much more. Their pressure is going to suck so much more. Okay? That's just the way it is. And this is more apparent in things like striking. Okay? You see people, you know, like, oh, that guy's just fast twitch. You know, you have like Nate, Nate Diaz versus, you know, Nate Diaz versus someone uh, who's a good example? Uh, Tyrone Woodley or something, right? Everyone always talks about his explosiveness, right? Even though these days I think he sucks, in my opinion. He still knocked me out, though. But that's a prime example. People see it in striking. But in jiu-jitsu and grappling, well, in grappling, yeah, wrestling, for sure. They'll see it, too. They'll see it, too. Brock Lesnar, gigantic motherfucker who, you know, he's a great wrestler and stuff. But he's... Just able to produce so much force. And he's fought guys who were also on steroids too. Make no mistake. That guy's trained force production for so long that it's like his force production capacity, his ability to produce force is so overwhelming on top of like his dominant wrestling style that he's able to keep people in certain positions so long. There's nothing they can do about it. So that's why strength is so important. Strength can be a great equalizer. You don't want it to be, but it can be. Okay, so you want to train strength. Okay, you want to do sets of five typically. Five, typically sets of five are ideal for a beginner, especially someone who's like a combat athlete who's never done strength training before. You start getting them really efficient in sets of five. That produces you know a little bit of muscular endurance, a little bit of hypertrophy, and a whole lot of force production. And over time, they you get their back squat like. Like I've had, I've had, I've had clients who, for example, one client who started off at like 149 pounds, and uh, in like six months he went from 149 pounds body weight to 169 pounds body weight, and he lost seven percent body fat somehow, and and this maybe the testing was faulty, I don't know, but his deadlift went from like like two like two uh, sixty five. Up to like three, was it 370, 370 pounds in that six month period. And, uh, you know, well, he, he does, he does wrestling and his ability to smash guys who are like in a different weight class went way up because force capacity went way up. And, and that's a short amount of time, right? But the thing is he, you know, and, and he wasn't even following the program a hundred percent. But that's just an example of like what can freaking happen if you train properly. And people who are like, eh, you know, strength is a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. If you have the right strength coach who understands you don't need to be doing a bunch of crazy strength shit, a bunch of crazy shit in the gym, you know, that's going to impede your ability to do your, your skills training. Um, you don't need to spend a bunch of time in the gym. You just do the most effective stuff in, in strength and then you do your skill training and you're golden. You'll see huge freaking gains in power production and strength. You'll notice your efficiency improves so much from that strength training that you don't have to use as much of your cardio anymore and as much of your endurance, your aerobic capacity, your aerobic threshold increases, your anaerobic threshold increases. So... Um, improving strength improves endurance. It improves power. It improves your leverage, your technique. And it needs to be trained separate from your skills training and your conditioning. So, and here's, here's how they, here's bridging the gap now. Here's how they bridge together, okay? So, just because you've gotten stronger, just because you've added 100 pounds to your deadlift does not mean you're going to immediately have an improvement in power production. You still need to train power to transfer that force production from the strength training into power production, okay? Into your punches, into your takedowns, into your, your suplexes, okay? So how do, you, how do you make that transference? So if you're training your skills at the same time as you're training your five rep max on, on squats, for example, okay? 
what you're going to be able to do is, let's say you do, you're doing your strength training and that's increasing your force throughout the week. When you do wrestling practice, train with the intention of being more explosive. Now, you don't want to take your opponent, you take your partners down and injure them. You need to set them down in a controlled fashion. But when you explode for a takedown, you need to be explosive. When you, when you, when you do your techniques in training, you're going to be training power specific for your sport. When you do sparring, okay, you're going to be training, as long as you're training with the intention to explode, the intention to be fast, the intention to, to, uh, to, to be more explosive and more efficient and all of these things, okay, you're training speed, you're training power, you're training endurance in your sports practice. Okay, that is going to create this this kind of like ebb and flow of transference. It's like okay, Monday I did strength in the morning, and then I do my jujitsu and and Monday evening. The next day I don't do strength training, but I do a hard wrestling practice where we're doing takedowns and stuff. You're getting power production training. You're getting velocity and speed production training, and you're getting sports specific uh, cardio adaptations from that wrestling practice that next day that is conditioning that is training that force production from that strength to transfer over into the sport and that is kind of like this complementary ebb and flow but the importance needs to be on uh, being able to recover because if you're training too hard in your strength training, if you're doing, uh, if you're training max effort every single day, okay, you can do that maybe twice a week, okay. You can train to an RPE ten on like one or two sets on your strength training, and still recover for MMA as long as your MMA coach is moderating his training as well. Um, but the more max intensity of anything you do, the the more plateaus you're going to reach. The harder it's going to be to recover, the more injuries you're going to sustain, and the less productive training becomes. Okay, and that goes for for your MMA training as well. So if you train, if even if you don't train hard on on Wednesday or on Monday, let's say you do like a moderate strength training that was still productive on Monday, and then you go in and you do a hard jujitsu practice that same night. Okay, the next day you're you're going to have aches and pains. You're going to be sore. And you're going to feel you're going to have motivation problems. That comes as a direct byproduct from the pro-inflammatory cytokines that are built from that hard training that day before. This next day, you need to moderate training to allow you to recover. But let's say you have another hard training session on Tuesday. So Tuesday, you come in and you do you know you don't do strength or anything, but you do a really hard like wrestling practice. Well, now you're you're accumulating even more stress. And more breakdown. Okay, you're getting, you're still getting conditioning adaptations and more technique and and, and skill, but you're feeling beat down. So that's so so Wednesday definitely needs to be a recovery day. Let's say you go in on Wednesday and maybe you hit another strength training. Well, hopefully you don't go hard in strength training because that's where injury is like really high, injury risk. You know, because you're already beat up. That wear and tear is accumulating. You need to auto-regulate that strength training to where it's still productive enough to produce more force adaptations. And then that Wednesday you go in, that Wednesday night you go in and you do a hard MMA practice. If that MMA practice is, again, hard, if it's as intense as as the two days before, or especially if it's more intense, good freaking luck coming in on Thursday and doing anything productive, okay? This fatigue can last... 48 hours or more, depending on how hard it is. The harder the training is, the longer it takes for that fatigue to dissipate. And intense training is important, but there has to be a moderation of some kind. Um, and so if so that Wednesday, if it's hard again, you're 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 just it's like a steaming pot of a pot of steam. The more steam, the more that it boils over, you've got to let some out. So you're going to feel like you need to take a recovery day. And if you just keep training hard the whole week and then you wait till the weekend, 
your body is going to pour all of its resources into recovering from all that that built up inflammation and damage and wear and tear and adaptation the ability for your body to pour resources towards adapting and getting stronger or getting more efficient like your brain is going to be so dead from all the neurological fatigue that it's not going to be able to efficiently process those techniques you're going to have blunted adaptation response when you come back in after the weekend's over so this is a very bad kind of like cycle that needs to be addressed and a, uh, a lot of old school trading methodologies kind of like thrive on this and it's like it can work it can reduce champions but to what at what cost what consequence everything you do in your training is going to have a consequence so you need to be able to get the mo the whole goal should be getting the most adaptations out of the least amount of effort or more so the least amount of recovery cost it's called stimulus to fatigue ratio okay so you need to have a baseline level of high volume high frequency skills training that focuses on being more efficient and effective um, in all aspects with as little recovery cost as possible so you can train uh, effectively uh, more frequently without dying <laughs> And their strength training needs to be geared at improving force production capacity. And if you need more cardio, do more sparring rounds, okay? And you need to have you need to have that that sparring set in a way that is as realistic as possible for the specific uh, competition, and also gives you those conditioning gains. Now. This is where we need to kind of change the fit the um, two-factor model a little bit from the way Mark Ripito had it. Conditioning and power training and, and cardio training still matter. So um, you cannot sustain, you know, even light sparring, you know, <laughs> over and over again every single day, okay? Some people, a lot of people are going to, and they're going to need specific things. Like if someone has trouble with their striking they can do more like cardio conditioning on the heavy bag do and doing specific shadow boxing drills and footwork drills and stuff like that um, and you could do kind of like interval training on the heavy bag where you're getting practice on like let's say someone has sucky hooks and kicks maybe their hips are not working right kicking over and over again for one minute just hard as you can and then one minute off and then one minute on and one minute off that can build that aerobic you know high intensity conditioning in a specific way that's specific to build that very weak point that they need um, at their port you know specific point in athletic development whereas someone else they just might need a little bit extra cardio conditioning especially if they need to get some fat off right um, and so that athlete can go and uh, they can run, you know, a, you know, do like a, a four mile run, maybe twice a week, and that can help serve as recovery, can build their aerobic capacity and their ability to sustain a higher amount of uh, energy for a longer period of time. Now, interval training is tricky. High intensity interval training, you know, there's Tabata methods, there's intervals, circuits, there's circuit training, uh, there's. Uh, there's every minute on the minute, like EMOMs. Um, there's uh, what I, li I like, escalating density training. There is, um, what's the other one? Uh, not cascade training. What am I trying to say? How am I forgetting this? Cluster sets, cluster sets. Um, there's a lot of different ways of getting high intensity conditioning for that aerobic capacity and glycolytic capacity without um without like building up too much fatigue in between it all depends like so you could do you could do you could do uh hill sprint circuits you could do um or not circuits intervals intervals with hill sprints treadmill intervals heavy bag intervals you could do um intervals using like uh kettlebells you know you could do burpees i love burpees there is a lot of different ways that you can do um, 
conditioning, intervals and glycolytic conditioning and stuff like that. But the thing is, we need to focus on the 20% of methods that yield us 80% of results. And so if that 20% and, and for most people, they have their conditioning on that, you know, high intensity range is fine in their off season. You do enough rustling, you do enough MMA, you do enough um, jujitsu, you don't need to go and, and, and do Tabatas and interval training all the time. Because the more conditioning you do in between sessions, the more recovery you're going to need that's going to interfere with your MMA training. So MMA training is number one, okay, or jujitsu training or whatever. Your sport practice is number one. That extra conditioning can be on the side, but you need to f see your, your, your uh, skills training as conditioning, and you need to train with intention. Build your conditioning, build your skills, and build your strength all at the same time. And so Olympic lifts are good for helping to transfer that power into power input. The closer you get to your competition, the more you need to focus on um, things like Olympic lifting variations and sprint intervals and stuff like that. We'll, we'll get into more specific modalities and periodization and stuff like that um, in future videos. But let's just kind of leave this as a groundwork, and I'll talk to you guys in the next video.